Ahoy there. No, you didn't misread the title. I meant exactly what it says. Many people seem to treat communism and capitalism as binary essentials, much like hot and cold, liquid and solid, or light and dark. This is false, and I aim to, if not outright convince you, at the very least give you cause to reconsider the political slogan or slur you're thinking of lobbing at me in the comment section. I won't lie, this is my third attempt fully reworking this script. The first two were so long, so dense, and so packed full of esoteric jargon and wanton side tangents that they read more like an arcane ballad than a political thesis. Fortunately, the more I trimmed it down, the more I recognized the watermarks of four of my other videos in its design. So I'll link those below for your further viewing if what I'm about to say sparks your interest. Now, with that being said, in accordance with my second and third channel rules, I won't waste too much time going over why communism is a failed experiment. You can find that in pretty much any region of the internet where they still practice even a vague semblance of common sense. However, the briefest of synopses is required just for the sake of getting us all off on the same start. To put it most basically, communism fails because it always devolves into a technocratic dictatorship, which is a state in which all citizens, that is non-ruling class members, are disposable tools of the ruling class's devices, to be used and abused and ultimately discarded as their overlords see fit. The reason this always happens is because in order to engineer a society according to the Marxist maxim, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs, one must first seize all the assets of society, dump them into a collective communal pot, and then redistribute them equally to all the masses. The problem is that whoever does the initial seizing always becomes the new ruling class. And so, rather than actually addressing or redressing the core issue of societal decohesion that comes part and parcel with industrial expansion, it merely shuffles it around, and so only succeeds in trading one dystopian variant, feudal oligopoly, for another, technocratic dictatorship. And it is the former form that is of particular interest to me for this video. But before we get into that, let us quickly examine the words communism and capitalism themselves in a bit more intimate detail, shall we? Commune, noun, a group of people living together and sharing possessions and responsibilities. Capital, noun, a thing that confers value to its owner. Ism, noun, a distinctive practice or system, typically a political ideology or artistic movement. Now, if we recall how I've defined an ideology, the study of an abstract ideal fantasy, then what we have here, in the abstract sense, is a duel between the idealistic fantasy of everyone living in communal harmony versus the idealistic fantasy of everyone becoming a millionaire. Except, not quite. To understand why capitalism, as an ideology, is always slated to fail just as spectacularly as its more homeopathic counterpart, albeit on a much longer time scale, we must first understand the critical failure point of all ideologies, that being that they always conflate what should be for what is, and in so doing they always end up sacrificing pragmatism on the altar of idealism. For my purposes, this self-delusional paradigm can be thought of as a wishful if-then statement. If everyone simply does or thinks X, then problem Y would simply cease to exist. On the one hand, the communists assert that if everyone just stopped being so selfish, the world wouldn't have suffering. Their conceit to put it in the most charitable terms possible, being that their idea is so childishly simplistic, on account of being the brainchild of literal children who don't know anything about anything but think they know everything because they read a book with no pictures once. Their only choice is to either assume that everyone outside of their little academic bubble are too brutish and stupid to have conjured up such a concept before, or they could grow a shred of humility, go outside and realize that there are real, tangible, practical obstacles to world peace and harmony that they have not hitherto had knowledge of. But of course, that would require actual principles and effort, not to mention actual intelligence. So there's exponentially more hope of making gold in a test tube by stirring lead up with mercury and sulfur. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the capitalists will tell you that if everyone put all their efforts into making money, everyone would be rich. But even notwithstanding the Pareto principle, a.k.a. the 80-20 rule, which says that, in general, circa 80% of consequences result from 20% of the causes, and if we disregard everything we know about game theory, the actual psychological model, not the YouTube channel, 
If everyone did just drop everything to focus exclusively on accumulating capital, you won't have an economy for very long because they'll have no time or energy left over for procreation, which is where the vast majority of humans are compelled to put the vast majority of their efforts under natural circumstances, and a society that doesn't procreate goes extinct. Just as with the communists, the capitalists arrogantly assume their utopian conception has never occurred to anyone outside of their elitist hegemony, mainly because most of them have never associated with anyone whom they view as being of inferior stature. And here is where we find the crux of the problem that I allude to in the title. Each of these ideological mindsets and their associated praxis predicate their validity on two fundamental egalitarian absurdities. One, that all humans are functionally interchangeable in terms of their ultimate potential and ability, and two, that we are all fundamentally equivalent in our aspirations and motivations. In plain English terms, if person A is a millionaire and person B is not, the communists will claim that it is the fault of oppressive systemic forces perpetuated, if not outright created, by person A. Whereas the capitalists will claim that it is because person B is either incompetent or simply lazy. Whereas I would posit that the reality is at once both of these things and neither, that perhaps people are neither interchangeably competent or motivated, i.e. we're not all good at the same things and we don't all want the same things, though for some reason nobody ever seems to account for the latter, and this is why I say that capitalism, that is the ideological pursuit of wealth as the absolute measure of individual worth and virtue, just like communism, the ideological pursuit of perfect egalitarian entropy as the same, will always fail to produce anything beyond a corporatocratic, technocratic, feudalistic dystopia, wherein the only people who truly win are the cynical shepherds who orchestrated this whole moralistic pantomime in the first place. And therefore, trading one for the other is just choosing your civilization's method of execution. But anyway, that about fills up my political bingo sheet for this month, I think. However, the very last thought I feel is pertinent but that I couldn't find a more diegetic way to include without excessively bloating the script, is that money, as a common medium for value exchange, is not supposed to have value in and of itself. But under a social curtain, it obtains its own independent value owing to its desirability as a social commodity. I.e., money grants you access to the energy and resources of others, and thus affords you a certain degree of power over them. Ergo, the more of it you have, the more social power you wield, up to a point. For when all the gold is just sitting in a miser's vault, it has no more worth, as defined by its utility, than when it was still buried underground. Right, now I'm actually done. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, and remember to keep your mind open, not empty. Peace.